we're live. Hi, I'm Sandy Captain, and I'm a local Greeniac as well as a director on the League of Women Voters of Elgin area and also chair of Elgin Green Groups or EGG350.org. And this is my good friend, Robin Miguel, who's also a Greeniac, Greeniac at large and co-chair of unnamed co-chair. She does not want to be co-chair of right. Elgin Green Groups 350. And she's joining us tonight because we're working on the environment. We're all working together on this. And we're just really excited to show you the first two videos of the series that Drawdown put out that's very, very, very accessible. The two together are just about a half hour. We wanna show you the one minute trailer first and you can get on the rest of these yourselves if you want or call me or email me and happy to get you set up with the rest of them. But uh, we'd like to get going and watch the trailer and setting the stage is the first one we'll see tonight. And the second one is stopping climate change. And as you've all heard the reports that came out Monday, the report from IPCC were in the red zone, but this is the solu this is solutions. This is how to mitigate and adapt, mitigate climate change. Okay, so, so let's I ask before we started, has everyone, is everyone aware of the new IPCC report, the 4,000 page report that says basically we're in the red zone, right? So we, we get that it's a problem. Yeah. Yes? Yeah. Okay. All right. So I'm going to, all right, forgive our technical like unwizardry, uh, but we're going to try to share the screen. Uh, We've got the share the sound and we're going to start the trailer now. Our water, our food, our air, our health, our security, our economy are all connected to what happens to weather and climate. I'm convinced we actually have the solutions and technologies at our fingertips to get going and solve this problem. So that means that there are going to be new people employed in that sector. We get to build the future we want. It hasn't happened yet. The future is ours to choose. So now, forgive us if we're a little goofy. Um, Sometimes getting away from the truck, there it is. Okay, so now we're gonna go to unit one. Can y'all hear us? Yeah, sounds great. Okay, great. Does anybody have any comments about that little trailer? I, I have one. Okay. It makes me feel good. Yeah. And a lot of what I read and study about climate change doesn't make me feel good, but that trailer makes me feel good. So I'm gonna go on to unit one, setting the stage. And that I think is like 13 minutes or something. Yeah. Here we go. So welcome to Climate Solutions 101. We're gonna get started to think about how we're gonna address climate change and how we're gonna solve one of the world's biggest problems. We wanna set the stage and understand how this moment in human history, this moment of climate change and climate solutions got started in the first place. When we think about human history, we have to go back a long, long time. It turns out our ancient ancestors started walking this planet about six million years ago. And during all that time, early humans and our ancestors started to affect the environment, but they did it very locally, just right around where they lived. But something really changed in the last century, especially the last 50 years or so. We began to change the entire planet. 
all at once in several different ways. Well, one of the things that happened, of course, is there are a lot more people on the planet. We're now over seven and a half billion people walking the earth today and climbing. We also, for the first time in history, became an urban species. Over half the people on earth now live in a city. That's never happened before. We also formed a global economy that is powered by technology and international trade and has been growing faster than ever. In fact, if you look at the last 50 years, we see about a doubling of global population. The economy globally grew between five and six fold. So think about that, twice as many people doing almost six times more stuff. We then use about three times more food, twice as much water, and three times more fossil fuels than we did back in 1970. In the last 50 years, we have changed more than the previous six million years. In a way, it's kind of an inflection point. It's when everything's changing. Even the way we're changing is changing right now. And unfortunately, this change in us is also changing the planet in ways that are incredibly disruptive. Some of these changes you can see by just looking out the window. They're obvious. They're really right in front of you. For example, when we cut down a forest, we go in with chainsaws and bulldozers and set things on fire. You obviously can see that. And we're doing a lot of it. If we look at the Earth from outer space, we can see forest with a satellite. Here's a picture of a pretty remote part of the Amazon in Bolivia in the 1970s. And if you look carefully, there's a little dirt road running right through the middle of that forest. The very first clearings, just starting in 1975. But if we go back here about 25 years later, the whole area has been radically transformed into soybean fields. And those soybeans are being shipped all the way to China to be used as animal feed. So a global economy connecting the Amazon to Chinese pigs is clearing rainforest in a remote part of the world. And this is happening everywhere. In fact, we're seeing so far about 30% of all the tropical forests on Earth have been lost, and a lot of that in the last few decades. We also see how agriculture, just farming, is changing the world. We usually think of farming on a small scale, like an individual farmer's field. We can walk through it, we can pull up a carrot, we can look at the cows and all this kind of thing. But agriculture is now a global force. Again, if we look at it from satellite, the earth is covered in agriculture. This map shows in green the areas where we grow our crops. That includes the plants we eat, of course, but also the plants we feed to animals, and some we feed to cars in the form of biofuels. The brown areas are where we actually raise the remaining animals, our pastures and rangelands. And if you put it all together, agriculture now covers over a third, between 35 and 40 percent, of all the land on the planet. It is now the largest ecosystem on Earth, and that's incredible. So we've changed forests, we've changed the world through agriculture, and we're also changing the nature of water across the planet. We're a pretty thirsty species. We use a lot of water on this planet for our homes to drink, and we use water in industry, and we use most of our water, though, in agriculture. About 70% of the water we take out of nature is used for just one thing, irrigation. Let me show you how that can affect the world, though. Here's a picture of the Aral Sea from the late 1960s. This is a satellite picture showing one of the world's largest inland bodies of water in the middle of Central Asia, in Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan. But the Soviet Union in the 60s and 70s diverted the rivers that would feed the Aral Sea. Instead, they sent that water over into the deserts of Kazakhstan to grow cotton in the middle of the desert. And this is what happened. It shut off the water supply of one of the world's great inland seas and it disappeared. And this is not just unique to Central Asia. This kind of overuse of water resources is happening in California. It's happening in the Midwest, in the Great Plains, in our Agawala Aquifer. It happens in North Africa. It happens in Australia. It happens in China and everywhere. In fact, our thirst for water has massively disrupted water resources and ecosystems across the globe. So these changes we've seen in like forest and land and water, they're just plain as day. We can see them, we can photograph them, they're right in front of us. But some other changes happening to the planet were initially a little bit more subtle, especially changes to our atmosphere and to the climate of our planet. This story actually begins more or less in the 1800s. Starting back then, we began activities, especially the burning of fossil fuels 
and the exclusion of agriculture that started to change the nature of our atmosphere. For example, we saw that CO2 levels, one of the major so-called greenhouse gases, started to increase from the 1800s till about now. And it's so far increased by about 50%. And today, greenhouse gas levels are higher than they've been for three to five million years. We've never seen something like this in any time in human existence. And later I'll talk about this, how greenhouse gases going up causes the temperature of the planet to go up. And while the greenhouse gases like CO2 have risen, so have the temperatures of our planet. In fact, the temperature of our planet is warmed by about one degree Celsius already. Initially, that was a little subtle, maybe it was a half a degree or six tenths of a degree and so on. And we could argue whether this was happening or not. But today it is plain as day that we have changed the temperature of our planet and it's getting warmer faster all the time. We're seeing the effects of a warmer planet almost everywhere we look. One of the early signs was looking at our glaciers. Here in Alaska, we have the Muir Glacier, which now has to be relabeled Muir Lake. We also see in South America, on the other side of the world, how glaciers in Patagonia and South America are melting, forming large lakes as well. Perhaps most disturbingly, though, is changes to an entire ocean. We're seeing how the Arctic Ocean, which is usually covered in sea ice year round, has been melting year by year by year. Here in the 1980s, we see when sea ice is at its kind of minimum in late summer, early fall, but by the early 2010s, we see a massive reduction in sea ice, which continues to this day. And soon, maybe within a decade or so, we'll have the first ice-free Arctic months in all of recent geologic time. And we're seeing a planet radically transformed by our actions. And again, this all became possible in the last 50 years or so. Scientists often call this period of time the Great Acceleration, when everything started to take off. We see population change, urbanization, globalization, and then we started clearing ecosystems like forest, and we built up more and more farms around the world. We started building huge dams and using more and more water than ever before. We also used more fertilizers and more chemicals, especially in agriculture and industry, and those changed the nature of water, even at the scale of our oceans. And then, of course, we're farming the oceans. We're harvesting more fish than ever and doing what we call aquaculture or fish farms on a scale unlike anything we've ever seen. But the really scary big thing that's happening, of course, is climate change. Our use of energy, our clearing of land, and a few other things have changed the nature of the entire atmosphere forever. And those changes are gonna make the planet warmer. And if we keep going, it's gonna be a massive disruption to everything on the planet. Not just the thermometers, not just the polar bears, but us. In fact, climate change has the potential to hurt the most vulnerable people among us. People living right on the edge of poverty or food security or having fresh water or good safe places to live. Climate change is gonna put a huge burden on future generations. People who didn't emit anything, they're not even born yet. And yet we could be leaving a giant mess on their doorstep that could last for centuries or thousands of years. Now, I wouldn't blame you one bit if you took all of this information in and said, this looks really grim and maybe it's even hopeless. I'm gonna stop you right there because it's not true. It is not hopeless at all. In fact, there are a lot of things that are getting better at the same time the environmental situation is getting worse. Let me remind you of a few of these. During the last 50 years, for example, humans have gotten healthier. We used to live to be about 55 years on average on this planet, just back in the 1970s. Today, the average person on Earth can be expecting to live to be over 70, 71. That's amazing. We also see that women have many fewer children. 50 years ago, the average woman on Earth had over five children. On average, today it's 2.4 and falling faster than anybody ever predicted. And those children are healthier, with stronger families, and women have more opportunities than they've had before. We also see the world is far more literate than it's ever been. Today, 86% of the world's population can read and write. Back in 1970, that was only 50%. And back in 1900, it was only 15%. And at that point, it was the highest in all of history. 
We are healthier, we have more rights, and we're more educated and literate than anybody who's ever lived before. We're also more urban, we're more mobile, we're more connected and less violent than any people who've ever walked before us. So this is an interesting paradox, isn't it? Some things are getting better, some things are really getting worse. A lot of people come up to me and ask like, well, so what's the future going to be? Is it going to be a total disaster, kind of like a Mad Max movie, some dystopian science fiction disaster film? Or is it going to be awesome? Is it going to be like a Star Trek movie where we pull ourselves out of this mess and build an incredible future and seize this amazing opportunity we have to become better? Which one's it going to be? Well, the answer is, it's up to you. It's up to us. It's up to everybody. We get to build the future we want. It hasn't happened yet. We don't know what tomorrow is going to be because we haven't built tomorrow yet. The future is ours to choose. So we have to choose a good one. And we can choose a world if we want to, if we really put our minds to it, we still have the ability to build a future where people and nature can thrive today and tomorrow. But to get there, we're going to have to do the hardest thing of all. We're going to have to step back as a people and make our choice. To make the choice of a generation, of this moment in history. We have to choose between the people we are or the people we can be. The people like some of our ancestors who gave everything so that we could live better lives. We are capable of so much and yet we've realized so little. What do we choose? And we could choose the world that is. That's a giant mess right now in a lot of ways. Or we could choose the world that could be an incredible world full of potential when we seize all of our creativity and energy to build the world that we want. So which one are you going to choose? Which one are we all going to choose? The future of the world and everyone who will live after us will depend on that decision. To the Zoom? No, no, no. To the Zoom meeting and how we get back. Okay, I'm sharing. How do I do that? On my own Zoom? Maybe I just connected us? <laughs> No, the next one is I don't see that we're still sharing the screen. Let me reconnect to Zoom. Let me But when I go to Zoom, you you are still sharing. Oh, we are. Okay. I don't yeah. know how to get back bring to the controls back up. Can you guys see us? Can we make a comment about the one we just saw. Yeah, yes. I'd like to have a conversation about it. I just can't see anybody and I, I'm sorry, I'm a Zoom boob. Can you guys see us? Yes, over on okay. the side. Well, I'm sure we're cute. We don't need to see ourselves and we can't see you, but I, I would definitely love to see, to have some conversation about what we just saw. Does anybody have something that they'd like to share? Yes, I put it in chat because I couldn't unmute. Now I've unmuted. But anyway, yeah, there you so are. Um, okay. <laughs> I stopped your screen share for you. <laughs> Thank you. What she did? Anyway, yes, um, Wendy, Wendy saved he, us. he said something about the world being less violent, and I de definitely disagree that with was, that. I, that was amazing, but I think it, well, I mean, there know, are still lots of wars. And okay, but surely what less. he's talking about is statistically, Yeah, if you just look at statistics alone, we're at a point where we're at fewer wars than we've ever been in human history. But then there's all the violent shootings in the United States. And yeah. I don't yes, remember the, those happening the, before. 
That is true that we are still seeing violence and media would have us believe we are in the most violent of times. But if you look at statistics alone, we are less violent than we've ever been, which I know is surprising. That's yeah. surprising. It's surprising. And, but we have me. to be careful about, we have to be careful about media and yeah. what they tell us. Yeah. Like, here's an example. They're talking all about all this violence. Has anybody seen on mainstream media any news about the IPCC report? Yeah, that's what I was, that was my first comment I put in. There was a long okay. article about it yesterday in the Daily New Herald. Okay. Yeah. yeah. It started on the cool. front page and then continued um, later, and it had, was a, almost a half page article on it. Good. Good. I missed that somehow. I don't know how, because I normally- It, it was so. there yesterday. In the Daily Herald. I'll take a look. Yeah. So yes, I have said so, read about it. That's good. I didn't hear about it on the news, but I heard, read about it. Yeah. Yeah. Mainstream media is not covering it very well. But it, it's nice to know that it's in a local paper. Right. Yeah. So does anybody else have something they'd like to share? I do. It's Jennifer. Hi, Hi Jennifer. Jennifer. Our new chair or president of the League of Women Voters of Elgin area. Jennifer. Excited Ford. to you go, girl. Yeah, <laughs> excited. I even looked up what the, because I know Sandy was concerned about where the league is on this. So I looked up the U.S. position and I looked up the Illinois position. Sandy, we'll talk about it at the board meeting. There are things that they want to do and, and we have to choose to be active. But in terms of this video, I thought it was really, really well done but can one of you tell us something about project drawdown who are they oh my goodness it it refers to a book that had been written over it was put together over five years i think i'm not sure if it came out in 2013 i have it at home it's about the 80 solutions to climate change and they ranked them according to how much co2 Greenhouse gases are removed, the cost, the feasibility, and it, it's a worldwide type of a study that they did. And it had, I think, over 100 scientists and engineers and technicians combining their information. And it, it's a beautiful book to read. It, it's a paperback, but it's a large size one, only that thick, but it's like one chapter is one solution. Then there's another one that came out two or three years later, I bought that one. It's a little bit thinner, but it tries to put them into perspective, which they will do in this series as to what do we need to do first, second, what's the most important things we can do. I shouldn't say first, second, because he will tell us later, we have to do all of them all the time. No, but, I but, yeah, but the book does some. a good job of prioritizing right. what needs to be yeah. looked at first. In other words, what's yeah. going to give us the biggest bang for the buck? And right, the, the two biggest are the ones Sierra Club's working on right now is electricity. That's the 25% piece. And I think the 24% piece was um, transportation, I believe. So, and then they go through them and they say, basically there's five and buildings are like 6% agriculture. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Agriculture is second. Electricity is first, agriculture, then transportation, buildings, and that way. So they, they really simplify it so that you can tell what to do more, what's more important to do first uh, because time is of the essence. And I just want to let everybody know, I tried to say at the, at the dinner meeting, Elgin is in the process. I was at sustainability meeting last night and um, Mark Pruitt was there from MC squared and the city is again, this will be the third or fourth time, municipal aggregation of electricity that is renewable and this time, the price will be no higher than ComEd for as much renewable as we can get for the same price without charging anybody more money. He also talks about community solar and there's other options we can all get into, but this is for everybody. 
it's the biggest thing we can do across Elgin is to get 120,000 people on renewable electricity. You know, um, at no extra cost. I'd like to make a comment about the book. Um, the thing, so everybody in my family got that book for Christmas. Oh, you. wow. Thank you, Lois. I mean, um, what I, what impressed me about that book is not that it's not an explanation of the problem. It's an explanation of the problem with solutions. Solutions. It's and, solutions. And the thing that, that I was most amazed about is the number of jobs that get created by implementing these solutions. Yes. Yeah. The other thing that, and it makes total sense, but it was, it, it made my, it opened my eyes, is that one of the other biggest things um, that will help is education of women. That, that's, I, 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 way, I never thought of it in those terms, but if you think of a third world country, mm -hmm. if the women are educated, they're less likely to have um, many, many children, which put taxes our need to grow. Um, right. Oh, you oh, got Lois, muted. you accidentally muted yourself. No, I didn't do that. The cat did it. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, she's here now. Hey, that's, that's a smart cat. cat. Yeah. You're a Siamese. That's what you get. Right. <laughs> anyway, I, I that's what I liked about the book is the fact it's a book of solutions. And is the I, title of the book Project Drawdown? Yes. Okay. So I want to add to, if you go to the website, drawdown.org, there's an article about how efficient it is to educate women and how that is actually might be a more efficient way of getting solutions than some other fancy projects. And one of the biggest things they mentioned that was, it just absolutely stunned me because when I grew up, Lower, lower middle class, across the street from a fruit and veggie farm, you didn't waste anything. You didn't waste food. One of the biggest things we do, that we waste 24 to 40% of our foods. And, and this is worldwide. And he points out in a later video that um, some countries, because they don't have the transportation to get the food out, but we just, we throw it away and we have to reuse it. It's just a huge waste. It, it's something everybody can do. My thing is about hope, hopefully getting as many people empowered, like Greta Thunberg says, nobody's too small to make a difference. So I just want to build on what Sandy just said about, um, you know, not wasting. I don't know if you're familiar with SCARES. It's a local organization. They used to be in Glen Ellen, but now they're in Addison. Mm -hmm. And they're going to have a workshop. I don't remember the date. But if you go to scarce.org, I'm sure you can find out about it. And it's about a repair and reuse workshop um, mm -hmm. to help us kind of disengage from our throwaway culture. So look for that at scarce.org and, and look for some ways to recycle, some hard to recycle stuff at scarce.org. And sitting right next to me here is a zero waste person. Woman. I'm a zero waste I'm woman. So. I'm not there yet. I'm, you know, people, not people do yet. not believe that I live without a garbage can. I live without a trash can. I would like to give you that, that challenge. Remember the great American smoke out. I want to say, let's try the great American trash out. I want you to try to live one day without your trash can. And to do that, just everything you would put in there, you know, hide it. And then everything you would put in there, ask yourself, what is my alternative to this? I've been saving all my plastic bags, thanks to Robin, the stretchy ones and the non-stretchy. The stretchy ones go to Jewel, the non-stretchy Terra Vitae. We better go on no. to the next. Terra Cycle. Terra Cycle, sorry. Terra She's cycle. getting her Terra's confused. Terra Vitae. Terra Vitae is where she gets her food. Right. We better <laughs> go on to the next one. Are we ready? Anybody else have any other comments? We'll go on and on if you let us. No. No podiums. Okay. They like us. They're laughing. Okay. I'm going to try to share screen again. Forgive my Zoom boobery. All right. So I think this That's is it. what we want. That's the one. 
and we have all this happy stuff. Climate change. And I found there's this like really cool thing to hide the floating meeting controls. And, and I'm just gonna play. Yeah. Look at that. 16 minutes. Okay, so now we're gonna look at how we can stop climate change and achieve what we call drawdown. Stopping climate change is necessary if we want to have a better future, because everything we do is connected back to climate change. Our water, our food, our air, our health, our security, our economy are all connected to what happens to weather and climate. So if we don't fix climate change, all the other things we care about in the future are going to be a lot harder. So we need to address climate change in order to have a better future with a prosperous economy, with resilience, equity, justice, and creativity, all the things we want, demand that we address climate change. And that's what we're about. I work for something called Project Drawdown, which is the world's leading resource for climate solutions. We focus on the science we need to know to address climate change and then share it with the world. But why do we use that word drawdown? What does that even mean? Well, drawdown refers to a point in time, in the future, and it refers to the greenhouse gas levels in the atmosphere. Now, remember I told you in the last unit, greenhouse gases have been building up in the atmosphere. Here we are today at the 2020 levels. But then we can choose what happens next. On the path we're on now, we'll just continue to build up these gases, which will just warm the planet more, making the problem worse. But we don't have to do that. We can bend the curve. Bending the curve on climate change means reversing the curve of growing greenhouse gases. And when we hit this point, the little blue dot here, that's the moment of drawdown. That's the moment when greenhouse gases stop climbing and they begin to go back down again into a healthier place. So drawdown is the moment in the future when greenhouse gas levels stabilize and stop climbing and then they start to steadily decline. And that's when we begin to stop climate change. At Project Drawdown, our job is to get the world to drawdown as quickly, safely, and equitably as possible. So how do we get there? Well, first, we're gonna to have to learn a little bit of science. It won't be too hard, but it's the stuff we really do need to know to kind of get forward on climate solutions. So first of all, what are greenhouse gases? Well, you've heard a little bit about this before, I'm sure. You know that greenhouse gases kind of lit in the sun's heat and they trap the Earth's heat as Earth is radiating out into outer space. So essentially they trap heat and the more gases means the more heat. And that's why the planet's warming up. Pretty simple. There's a little bit more to it. It turns out that Earth already had greenhouse gases before we came along. There were natural greenhouse gases like water vapor, a little bit of carbon dioxide, and a few other things that have been there for millions, if not billions, of years of Earth history. But then we've got these things we call anthropogenic greenhouse gases, or human-caused greenhouse gases, that we've been adding on top of that. And those include more carbon dioxide than was there before, more methane, more nitrous oxide, We've added chemicals that weren't even in the atmosphere before, like fluorinated gases, so-called chlorofluorocarbons, hydrofluorocarbons, and so on, and many other gases that are impacting our climate. And we can actually see how they've been rising over the last 100, 200 years, and especially in the last few decades. We have changed the nature of Earth's atmosphere and added a human greenhouse effect on top of natural greenhouse effect. And that's where we're getting into trouble. So what do these do? It's actually really simple physics. The idea is greenhouse gases are transparent. They let solar radiation, visible light, what we can see, right through them, like just a window. You can see right through it. But in infrared radiation, which you and I can't see, it is opaque. The infrared radiation is what Earth gives off to the rest of the universe, and so it can trap that heat in the atmosphere. It kind of works like this. Imagine a version of Earth with no atmosphere at all, like the moon. It would absorb the sun's radiation and warm up. The sun's heating the ground and the ground would warm up. The ground, just obeying the laws of physics, would also give off heat or infrared radiation back to the rest of the universe, out to outer space. And without an atmosphere, this is what it would look like. The sun's heat comes in, Earth heats goes out, and they'd be in perfect balance, 
and we'd be at a temperature that would be accordingly in balance with that. But now let's add an atmosphere, a natural atmosphere. So we have what was the natural greenhouse effect. The idea is as Earth is radiating its heat out into outer space, some of it would be absorbed by the air above it. And some of that would then be re-radiated back down towards the Earth's surface. That has the effect of making the Earth's surface a little bit warmer and the upper atmosphere a little bit colder. And that's exactly what Earth has had, and so are mainly all the other planets. Venus, Mars, and others also have a greenhouse effect kind of like that. But then humans come along and we add some more of those gases to the atmosphere. It'd be like adding another blanket on your bed in the wintertime. It traps more heat and keeps you toastier, a little bit warmer, and so on. And so this enhanced greenhouse effect traps a little bit more heat, radiates a little bit more down, and it warms the surface even more. And so far, we've warmed the planet about one degree Celsius. That doesn't sound like a lot, but think about it. During the last ice age, the planet as a whole was only three degrees colder than normal, and it was a totally different planet. This place was under about a mile of ice, in fact. We've warmed the planet in the other direction by about one degree so far, and we're gonna keep going. If we keep going to another two, three, or four degrees, that could be a world we wouldn't even recognize. It would be very, very dangerous for our civilization. So where do these gases come from? Well, I'm sure you've already heard that a lot of them come from burning fossil fuels, right? Burning oil and natural gas and coal and petroleum substitutes and all these things that we have. And that is part of the story. Burning fossil fuels does create CO2 and that causes about 62% of the warming we see on the planet today. So if you forget about everything else, fossil fuels cause more than half of climate change. But that's not all. It turns out that CO2 is also produced by a few other things, including chemistry. In fact, a lot of our industrial processes, especially making cement, releases CO2 into the atmosphere without burning anything at all. It's just kind of industrial chemistry. We also release a lot of CO2 into the atmosphere by burning down trees and deforestation. This green area shows you how much CO2 is caused by burning down forest, which is kind of like burning coal. Coal's dead, trees are alive, but they're both made out of carbon. And you burn them in our atmosphere, you will make carbon dioxide either way. Then we have our next greenhouse gas of methane. Methane is produced by a whole bunch of different things, but the two big sources are agriculture and industry. In agriculture, which is about two-thirds of this methane emissions, is caused largely from cattle. And you've heard all the jokes before, I'm sure, about cow farts. Turns out that's not even true. Cows actually burp methane. They don't fart methane any more than other animals. The other third of this methane comes from industry, especially mining natural gas gas wells, fracking, gas pipelines, even coal mines release methane as well. So we have to think about energy and industry and agriculture to look at methane. Then we've got this stuff called nitrous oxide, which a lot of people don't even think about, but it's a big part of our climate change equation. And nitrous oxide, some of that comes from industry, but again, a lot of it comes from agriculture, especially using too much fertilizer or too much manure on our farmer's fields. And finally, we have F gases or fluorinated gases, which are chemicals we use as refrigerants and sometimes as insulators in industrial processes. And those refrigerants like chlorofluorocarbons and hydrofluorocarbons are rising dramatically. And that's why we have to pay attention to this. So putting all those gases together, we emit about 52 gigatons of the equivalent of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere each year. What the heck is a gigaton? It's just a fancy word for a billion metric tons. So we emit 52 billion metric tons of pollution into the atmosphere every year. But there are only seven and a half billion of us. So on average, we're emitting many, many tons of pollution per person into the atmosphere. That's a huge amount. And we're gonna talk more about that and how we can cut that down. Another thing we have to notice is that each of these gases works a little bit differently. Some gases trap more heat than others, like methane and nitrous oxide and those fluorinated gases trap way more heat molecule for molecule than CO2 does. But some gases last longer in the atmosphere than others too. We've got to take that into account. 
Like methane, we emit today, most of it will be gone within 10 to 20 years. CO2 we emit today will be in the air for centuries and centuries to come. So we have to look at the strength and lifetime of these different gases. In particular, when we think about methane, methane again is that part of the wedge of our whole diagram of greenhouse gases. If we look at the impact of today's emissions on climate for the next 100 years, methane will cause about 16% of that warming over a 100-year period. But if we look at the next 20 years instead, the role of methane doubles and becomes 32%. So it turns out in the near term, our climate changes are going to be caused by mainly methane and other gases, but in the long term, they're going to be dominated by things like CO2. So which gas we focus on depends a little bit on what time period of climate change you're really most concerned about. We have to look at all of them. Now that we understand what greenhouse gases are and kind of how they work, we're going to look at what regulates the level of those gases in the atmosphere, what makes them go up and what makes them go down. To do this, sometimes it's helpful to think of a bathtub. But imagine a bathtub which we can fill and empty with water. We do that every day, right? Pretty simple. When we add water to the bathtub by turning on the faucet, we scientists call that a source. It's a source of water and it levels up the water in the bathtub. We can also remove water by opening up the drain and scientists call that a sink. You'll hear that word a lot about sinks of greenhouse gases. The difference between the sources and the sinks determines whether the water goes up or the water goes down. Sources add and make the water go up sinks remove and makes the water go down. Now, if you have a bathtub with the faucet on and the drain open, we have an interesting picture. If the sources are bigger than the sinks, the water level will still go up. But if the drain, the sink, is bigger than the faucet, the source, the water levels will go back down again. So let's take that and apply it to Earth's atmosphere. Well, Earth's atmosphere is basically a big bathtub in the sky. We can fill it with pollution and greenhouse gases, the sources of greenhouse gases, which is largely due to us. And then we have sinks of greenhouse gases, things that pull that pollution out of the sky and put it someplace else. We have sinks on this planet of greenhouse gases, primarily in plants on land, but also in the oceans. So here's the picture. We put pollution in the atmosphere, nature pulls it out in forest and in oceans. Now, right now, our sources of pollution, the stuff we're putting in the atmosphere, is much bigger than what nature can take out. And that's why the levels are going up. But what if we reduced our pollution? What if we brought it down by a half or so? Well, then maybe nature could kind of keep up with it and pull as much pollution out of the atmosphere as we're putting in. If that were to happen, we would hit that moment of drawdown and we'd stabilize CO2 levels and they'd stay flat. But we can go farther and actually reduce our pollution down to zero and pull more carbon and other stuff out of the atmosphere and actually have greenhouse gases decline and stop climate change and begin to reverse in the long term the damage we've done. So this balance between sources and sinks is what will determine the future of our planet and our climate. Now let's look at the numbers. In today's atmosphere, we see that we actually have about six major sources of greenhouse gas pollution. We'll go into them later, but you see electricity and food, industry, transportation, buildings, and other stuff. Then we have nature, which on land and in the oceans pull out a total of about 41% of those greenhouse gases, primarily the carbon dioxide part. And that leaves behind 59% of those greenhouse gases in the atmosphere building up year over year over year. So to achieve drawdown, to get them to reverse and bend the curve back down, we've got to work on both sides of this equation. We can work on the sources and bring them down to zero, kind of turning off that faucet over the coming decades so there's no pollution there at all. And we can also work with the sinks of carbon, starting with the natural ones that already exist, and make sure they can continue to pull that stuff out of the sky. So the idea of getting the drawdown actually will be based on three big principles, and these are important. The first thing we've got to do, and we always need to begin here, is reduce the problem before it even starts. Let's stop pollution before it even gets in the atmosphere so it doesn't cause any problems at all. And that means bringing these emissions down to zero. 
So we're going to have to zoom in and look at what causes these emissions, what's in the economy, what can we do about it in all of these different sectors from electricity to industry to agriculture and beyond. And if we do that, we can cause a big reduction in these things and eventually bring them down to zero. So job number one, stop pollution, bring it to zero. Job number two will be working over in the nature space, basically supporting nature's carbon cycle and maybe even adding to it in the form of sinks. That's the right-hand side of this diagram. We'll have to zoom in here and look on land and oceans about what controls their ability to take up carbon and how can we support that and maybe even augment it, making it stronger in the future. So we've looked at the left-hand side and the right-hand side of that big picture, the sources, the sinks, and we know what to do. But there's a third area we've got to talk about too, and we'll get into this later. It's about how, as we improve society, we can do things that, that aren't about climate change. They're things we should do anyway. But when we improve equality and equity and justice around the world, there are things we do there that actually have major secondary climate benefits. So we might get a twofer of improving human rights and equality and contributing to climate solutions. So working together, reducing pollution, supporting nature, and improving society are the three pillars of our climate solution space. Building on these three pillars and pulling them together all at the same time, we actually have all we need to address climate change in the coming decades. And this is gonna be our job over the next few units of this course. Okay, Wendy, can you save us here? Thank you. I wonder what we want to do. I, I don't know. We can talk about that later. Yeah. Anyway, unmute yourselves. Talk amongst yourselves and share your wisdom with us. So what do you think? And the next four sections, they really, really, really get into how do we do this? And it's very, very interesting. I've watched them several times and I pick up more things each time I watch them. So. I found it interesting that in mentioning pollutants, they didn't talk about all our automobiles and vehicles. You know, 16% is the automobiles. I was looking at the percents again. Oh, okay. And wait, yeah. it, that was mm -hmm. included in the CO2 portion, Shirley. Okay. They don't mention automobiles. But that's part of the CO2 equation. Yeah. Okay. A big part of it, actually. Yeah. yeah. That's why I was surprised they didn't mention it. Mm -hmm. I believe each gallon of gas that we burn throws out 18 pounds of CO2. Wow. It combines with oxygen. Each single gallon of gasoline. It, it, wow. The bad thing is, you know, we can't see it really. It, yeah. It's, it's, and keep in mind, this is an overview that if, when you want to drill down mm -hmm. further into what comprises the mm -hmm. CO2 picture, that's when it would get into automobiles. But if you look at how many EVs came out in 2021, mm -hmm. it's really mm -hmm. exciting, really exciting, the number of EVs that have come out in 2021 that are affordable yeah. with reasonable yeah. ranges. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So we, we have the technology now for people to drive yeah. electric vehicles affordably and the cost of ownership of an EV is much cheaper than an internal mm -hmm. combustion engine. And I can speak to that because I own two EVs, my motorcycles, electric, and so is my car. Mm -hmm. And all I do is charge it up and go. I use solar panels. My electric bill this month was $4.44. Yes, I'd mine. like to challenge you folks to be driving on $4.44 mm -hmm. for a month. Anyway, um, it's I, very I, doable. Very I doable. I looked into getting solar panels and I was told because of my neighbor's trees, I couldn't do it. Yeah, yeah. So you, you can think? look into community solar, Shirley May. For oh, those who can't have solar on their roof, Mm -hmm. Community solar is a very viable option. In but how do you find out about that? Shirley, um, do you live in Elgin? Yes. Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. If Elgin passes municipal renewable aggregation, well, yes. Anything. 
Yeah, but right now it's looking like community solar is a better option than municipal yeah. aggregation. So I don't agree. Um, <laughs> just get online and do a search on community solar mm -hmm. and okay. see what you find because it's available to us here in Elgin. Now, we were told okay. by Mark Pruitt last night, Elgin Green Groups had a program on community solar from another company. Mark Pruitt says that his company, MC Squared, uh, you can sign on and you, you don't put money down. You sign that you're going to pay X amount. I think it is per what you use. The other company said you sign on to a certain amount a month all year round. Do your homework. But yeah. Mark said you will never pay more. You, you have to give part of your money back to the people that have the community solar. You don't get to keep it all like we do who have it on our roofs. The other thing I want to say in terms of the, the vehicles, Dave and I are a little bit more conservative. I don't want range anxiety and neither does Dave. So he has a Camry right now. We're, we're going to get a PHEV. That's a hybrid electric. They don't have charging stations all over the place like they need them. Yeah. You can go total electric or you can go electric gas like we do. Um, so there's choices, you know. Yeah, anyway. hybrid. Would, would you guys like a little bit more explanation about what Sandy's talking about? Plug-in hybrid electric vehicles versus an electric vehicle? Sure. sure. Okay. So there's three kinds of vehicles. The normal car is called internal combustion. That's what most people drive today. Then you can get a full electric vehicle that does not have a gas tank. And that comes with some range anxiety. I have a 2015 Nissan Leaf. I get hundred miles on a charge. Once that runs out, I have to call the tow company. So I'm restricted to needing some sort of charging if I go past, let's say 50 miles. So I went camping up in Rockford. Thank God there's a great little microbrewery with a free charging station that I could plug in there or I could just get my campsite and plug in at my campsite. But the point is I cannot go round trip to Rockford and back because I have an EV that's older with only 115 miles. In between those two things is a thing called a plug-in hybrid electric vehicle yeah. or PHEV and Sandy has one of those. Volt. It's a Chevy Volt with and a there's, V. There's a bunch of them. There's I mean, a Chevy there's... Bolt with a V and that's an EV with a three a 250 mile. Actually the new ones I think have a 300 mile range. Yeah. Now I'm a normal, a fairly normal Elgenite, mm -hmm. fairly normal. Um, my, my Nissan Leaf with 110 miles, it, I have a lot of range anxiety. Even, and my electric motorcycle is also about 110 miles. And I have range anxiety. If I had a vehicle with a 300 mile range, mm -hmm. I probably would have no range anxiety. But I couldn't take a long trip with that. And if you go on a long trip, Dave and I have talked about even Southern Illinois, then you park and you have to charge up before you go anywhere else. So it, yeah. right now, until they get more charging stations, it, it's, it's Okay, limited. so e EVs are not good choices for if you do long distance driving. Right. But PHEVs, typically they give you between 25 and 30 miles on electricity only. I started out with 40. And then the gasoline engine kicks in and it gets a certain amount of mileage. Now, Sandy's Bolt gets mm -hmm. about 25 miles on her electricity. And then when the gasoline engine kicks in, mm -hmm. she gets 30 miles to the gallon. Mm -hmm. There's right. a thing called a Prius Prime. I think you have to live in mm -hmm. California to buy one. That gets 25 miles on the initial mm -hmm. electricity. And then when the gasoline engine kicks in, it gets 45 miles to the gallon. So the Prius Prime mm -hmm. is an excellent PHEV. Ford has a number of PHEVs mm -hmm. as well. Now in between, a in, there's a third, a fourth option, and that's mm -hmm. called a hybrid. 
So the ordinary Prius that you see running around, that's called a hybrid vehicle, not a PHEV. And that is always burning some gas. It's never just electricity, but it burns at a very much slower rate. Like uh, usually they get about 45 to 50 miles yeah. per gallon on, on yeah. a Prius Prime, but it's like all the time. Right. So if you just want to run to Walgreens, you're going to use a little bit of gasoline. Yeah. You know, so there are the four types of vehicles, internal combustion, mm -hmm. hybrid, PHEV, and EV, which mm -hmm. is just electricity. But mm -hmm. today, uh, 300 mile ranges are very common in, the, in a very wide range of electric vehicles that are available to And that includes the LEAF that Robin has or the Tesla. There's several other kinds. They're, they're all bringing them out now. Yeah. There's they're a, a little pricier. They are pricier. If you get on YouTube, you can mm -hmm. find a, um, a lot mm -hmm. of conversations about electric vehicles. So just go on YouTube and search if you're interested in shopping. And for people that think mm -hmm. they can't afford one, I, I just need to share this. I, I'm not rich. I bought in 2019, I bought my 2015 leaf for $10,000. Got it used. I got it used. And so if you get a used EV, they, they can be much more affordable than the new ones. You don't get the rebate, expensive. but you're getting You don't them get the rebate, way, but boy, they're cheap. Getting them at a lot less cost. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is there anything else you guys noticed in this particular one? Generally. There may be some more substantive questions from the group, but before we end uh, streaming, Sandy, would you tell us the details of the library programs? Is it once a week? Is it what? Tell it us what we're doing. September 16th, we're going to do the identical program like tonight, the two uh, in one. And the introduction. And the intro. And then the next week, four weeks in a row on Thursday nights at 6.30, for one hour and the league is sponsoring and Elgin Green Groups and Sierra Club. And we will have speakers with us in addition to Robin and myself. Um, Carl Maselli will help on session three. And I have Mary, um, not Mary, Mavis Bates. Mavis Bates for sure. The chair of, of Sierra Club is gonna be on several of them. Uh, Chris Caius from the Kane County Forest Preserve so four Thursdays in a row, 6.30 for one hour. So you can see the rest of these. Now you can see the rest of these yourself anytime. I've watched them three or four times and I take some notes and I always find something interesting. It, it, they make it sound doable. Are the programs in the library live? Yes. It'll well, be just like tonight. Just like tonight. And the... Uh, Se the first 16th. one is September 16th for four Thursdays and then September 23rd, September 30th and October 7th. Yeah. But are they on yeah. Zoom or are they yeah. in yes. the you register through Gale Board and yeah. Public Library? And we put two in the first because they're a little bit shorter and two in the last. So it's one, two, then three, then four, session four, and then five and six together. So... I hope you guys watch some of the rest of them or pick them up. You can do them on your own. Whenever you want, just go to Drawdown Climate Solutions 101. And it, it's, it's easy. And they'll, they're willing to share them with any group. They're free. There's no charge at all. They want to get the word out. Yeah, and Gail Board and Public Library has a nice YouTube channel that you can watch them afterwards, even though come join us so we have a lively discussion. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Robin, could you just give us a couple examples of how you do without a wastebasket? Ah. I mean, I found your, your, that comment amazing, you know? Yeah, many people don't believe me. Um, first <laughs> of all, say. first of all, the, the one comment that I want to make is, and it's, it seems a little philosophical and esoteric, but there's a big difference between willingness and desire. And so lots of us have the desire, very few have willingness. So find your willingness, find your willingness. And with the willingness will come uh, new ideas for how it works for you. Okay, so each household is different. 
right? Somebody with four kids is going to have a whole different story than I have. But one of the things that um, I have discovered is it does take time to manage my waste. Uh. It's not like it's going to magically happen. I have to devote some of my time to it. Okay. Now, one quick and dirty thing that I can share with you here in Elgin, we're really lucky, even though I can't mm -hmm. put it in my recycle bin, we can recycle styrofoam. Really? Yeah. I thought we couldn't. You oh. can't put it in your bin, but you can take it to Chicago Logistics. Oh, okay. And they're on Davis Road. They have one of those big toters out front that you can just put it on. They're in the Siegel build, building on Davis Road. Now, the key is it must be clean and it must be dry, right? And they'll take any styrofoam that you've got, peanuts, uh, to-go containers, oh. packing material, as long as it is really clean, like you would eat off of it, and really dry and no painted things some of the coffee cup type of things no it can be painted, painted? but it can't have it can be it can have a color on it but it can't have okay. a plastic sticky Liner. thing on it yeah okay so that's uh, a little tricky like for a while mcdonald's was giving you a styrofoam cup with some plastic mm -hmm. label on it that was glued on that they can't do anything with but they they've taken that off if it's stamped and a little bit of paint, they can take that. But if it has a sticky label on it, they, you have to remove any sticky labels. One thing I want to share with everybody is I learned this from Robin, how to recycle most plastics. There are so many of them. If you tear and they ruffle. I'll and demonstrate wish, while you're talking. You save them. I have two great big bird seed bags that Dave has for his two cockatoos and the three cockatiels great big bags and I keep the stretchy, roughly ridgy ones in there. The ones that are brittle and they just tear clean, that has to go to tear a cycle and you have to buy a box to, to get that sent. Okay, That's I'll talk sense. about that. So what Sandy's talking about is you take a plastic bag, you know, you can take plastic bags to jewel, There's like the stuff that your newspaper comes in. Oh, or yes. A bread wrapper. So one of the things you have to do with a bread wrapper is you have to take your bread wrapper and you have to turn it inside out and get all those crumbs out of it. Yes, right. Clean. So I turn it out. I shake it out. I go on my front door and I go like this. <laughs> so it's a clean, dry bag that can go to jewel. But so can this bag that, you know, I got some flowers in this. And the way that works is you stretch it. You tear it. If it stretches, tears, it makes this little roughly edge. Tears, ruffles, and ridges. That can go in with the bread bags to jewel, right? So here, let me demonstrate. So you, you pull, it should stretch, and then tear, and then ruffle. So that is a type of plastic that can go to the film's recyclers, right? So that includes... Like if you go and buy potting soil, that bag will do that. That's hard to clean. But the key is you have to clean it. Now, That's the way I clean it. those is I turn them inside out, I let them dry, and I wipe them with a, a dry rag until all the potting soil is gone. Mm -hmm. And then that can go in. to. And I just save all mine in this little, you know, I'll take this to Jewel, my little plastic bag, right, full of stuff that can go to films okay so meyer takes that also <clears throat> what my excuse me meyer takes that also meyer oh, will good. take them too and uh woodman's woodman's, woodman's. Up in carpenters will take them i didn't know that you know mm -hmm. and so then the other thing lonnie to to live zero waste i think about how i'm gonna throw something away before I buy it. And if there's, uh, an al if there's an alternative to a lot of packaging, I will find it. So for <laughs> instance, when I get my milk, I buy milk, I drink raw milk, I go to the farm, I take my own jars, I fill my own jars, and I bring them home. And then next week, I take my empties again. So I have found a way to get outside of milk bottles, right? I have. Um, and, and then I, and I also consider 
the type of packaging. So mm -hmm. like, you know, these meat diapers, they drive me crazy. Oh. But I buy my food from All Grass Farms and they don't have meat diapers and the plastic that they, they put their meat in, um, it'll have a label on it. I can soak that off very easily. And then this is what I do with all my plastic packaging that I can't put in this bag or that I can't put in the blue bin. There's a company called TerraCycle. It's T-E-R-R-A-C-Y-C-L-E. -E. And you can go to terracycle.com and you can purchase, now they're expensive, yeah. zero waste boxes. $80 for a box about... It's, it's big enough it'll last you a year. And it lasts quite a while. Or maybe two, depending on your consumption. But, but there's all kinds of them. And I also participate in a lot of the free TerraCycle programs. So you can bring your stuff to my house. And that would include <laughs> all toothpaste tubes, all toothbrushes, toothbrush oh. packaging, and floss containers. Wow. Razors, razor blade packaging, razor blades. Okay. Any personal care products, you know, if you use fancy shampoos that you can't put in the blue Deodorant. bin. Deodorant, you know, you can bring them to my house. And I and and now the new one is food containers, like rubber made food containers. If it's got a bottom and a top, because you know you can't put black plastic in your uh, blue bin. So if I have a black plastic container with a um, clear plastic top, mm -hmm. I can send that to TerraCycle for free. So there's a number of ones that I do for free. You guys know how to get a hold of Sandy. She'll tell you what I'll take and she'll tell you my um, address. And I, I got most of that on the website that I- Elgin Green Groups re I reimburse this guy who's, I, I say he's young. He's, he's younger than me, but like Dave said, everybody's younger than us. So we shouldn't say somebody who's younger because everybody is, but you know, he's, Court Stevens has done a great job with the website and these things are on the website and just, just call me, email me or Robin, I can give you her number. Yeah. And we got to, we got to draft her into League of Women Voters, by the way. I, I don't, I'm Robin, waiting. how, how I'm do sorry. you empty, how do you empty a toothpaste holder? Yeah. Oh, okay. I'll show you. Too. I'll show you. And she says <laughs> it's easy. I've tried it. Dave says you're doing what? <laughs> you got to explain this to a husband if you live with one of those. So, <laughs> not too easy to explain, I'm telling you. And we're okay. almost out of time, I think, right, Joan? Okay. Yeah. Uh, my friend Moni used to take her uh, styrofoam to Aurora. I don't know if she knows oh, yeah. that there's okay. a place in. I'll bring it to my house. I can. Take okay. It. So, this thing you can buy at any auto automotive department store it's they use it for auto body stuff and it's like just a little scraper right yeah it's great it's just a little scraper you could just ask them to show me this auto body stuff for scraping the like the putty on and then you take your toothpaste tube and you lay it on the counter right so that's going to be kind of hard to show you but and you take your little scraper and you just scrape that right out of there until you get all the toothpaste to come out of the little tip. I started doing right? that. You would not believe how much longer you can use that. Oh my God. <laughs> this, I had this toothpaste tube. It looks empty, doesn't it? Yes. Right? I could use this for another four weeks. Oh my God. Yeah. Yeah. You just scrape a little bit more out, you know, and you don't need a lot of toothpaste. But you can always use like baking soda on your teeth too yeah. and skip oh. these two, tubes. Oh. But if you have toothpaste tubes, you can bring them to me. Oh my but, gosh. But you don't have to go to the auto the store because Brianna bought those things at the kitchen store. Yeah, this this one I actually got from Pampered Chef. But but they have them at the auto store if you need them. But if you yeah. can find them at the kitchen store, great. What is yeah. the Pampered Chef? Well, they, when you buy a um, ceramic... Uh, jelly roll pan oh. from Pampered Chef. They include one of these in there. Uh, you know, cookie sheet or jelly roll pan. They're all their ceramic stuff. They because you scrape it to to clean it oh, with these things, and they're they're very good. They're very useful. I looked at right. that for I use it on my iron it. cookware too. It's like this is like better than a scrubby. <laughs> <laughs> 
-hmm. Well, I, I am finding this all very, very informative. And I think we should have more sessions on just this. Uh, well, what do you I'll think, come Jen? and talk to anybody. I'm a talker. <laughs> well, and the library had Robin, Robin yeah. do programs yeah. before. Yeah, I, had yeah, I tell them they should call the program White Trash Talks Trash, but they never, they don't want to call it that. But I'll come <laughs> talk about trash anytime you want. Just, oh my gosh. I, and I my am, newest phrase is like, we got to disengage from waste privilege. I want you to think about what I just said. We live in a world of waste privilege and waste privilege is way worse than white privilege. And the other phrase that- And we're all doing it. Robin, the other phrase you use is, and it really, there is no- Away. away. When you're gonna throw it away. When you throw something away, there is is really no no such place. There is really no such what? What? What there really is no what away you're throwing away, away. yeah no but away is a concept there. when we throw something in the trash it becomes harmful somewhere oh okay and that is a hard thing to know but mm-hmm. it is a fact there you is know, no away Dave and I love hiking when you know before his D which everybody gets that sooner or later you know it's got to have a knee replacement one of these days um. But in the national parks, the state parks, your county, any kind of park, you look at all the stuff on the, on the ground, it, it, it's all used by something in, in the biosphere. There isn't any, any bad stuff there well, if, if, but, unless we put it there. But even in a landfill, mm-hmm. but plastic does not biodegrade. It does not. And styrofoam is forever. And anything not. that's in a landfill is going to end up in your river. Oh, and wow. anything that's in your river is going to end up in your rain. And anything in your rain is going to end up in your body. And today, plastic in rain is measurable. Well, I did so we that. have to stop. Um, we have to stop. And industry is starting and it, to take it is, steps. it's up to us. Industry we, is taking steps to reduce the plastics, find ways to decompose the plastics, to change it into something they can use over again. We're probably out of time, right, Jennifer? Okay, before we end, uh, first of all, thank you, Sandy, for putting this together. Thank you, Robin, for being our guest. But I want to do a quick advertisement for this series. The League of Women Voters does this type of program the second Wednesday of every month at 7 o'clock. And our next one is September 8th. Uh, the, uh, The League has sponsored Women on the Brink, which is an organization to help women on the brink of poverty. And then the following month on October 13th, there'll be a program on gun violence. We hope you all join us. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much, Sandy and Robin. Wow. Nice to see you again, Robin. Yeah, good to see you all. Yeah. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) Thank you. Greeniacs unite.